Uh, let me begin with an announcement for the topical group on precision measurements and fundamental constants. It's a, a topical group of APS organization. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, these uh, problems that our group care about are very near and dear to Stuart. Stuart was the chair of this topical group last year. Um, uh, we are always looking for new members to join us. And if you're interested in the list of problems uh, here, please contact Chen Yu Liu, who is uh, in the audience uh, after the session. Uh, so we, we would love to see new members join us. So I'm going to talk about uh, laser trapping of radioactive atoms, Stuart's pioneering work, and all the work that has happened uh, after that. Uh, I want to first start by recognizing the support of DOE Office of Nuclear Physics. This office uh, supports me, and it has supported Stuart for many decades throughout this uh, period. Laser trapping happened uh, in the late 80s, I think the first trapping paper came out in 87. It was done at the Bell Laboratory by Steve Chu and Dave Pritchard collaboration. And then a few groups started reproducing these results. This is a picture I love very much. It was taken in Bill Phillips' laboratory at NIST. And here you see uh, a blob of sodium atoms, about a million atoms, held by light in the middle of a vacuum chamber. Of course, you don't see the laser beams when they go across inside the vacuum chamber. You only see the photons when they scatter off something. So here, photons are scattered off atoms, uh, and you see a bright dot in the middle of the chamber. And in this experiment, uh, the, the group was doing a, a, a trampoline experiment. They would release the atoms. They would, atoms would fall and, and bounce back from this trampoline, and then you see atoms bounce up and down many, many times. So they were having a lot of fun. When Stuart saw that, he recognized that this could be very useful for beta decay studies. And the way he described to me was that this is really a theorist view of radioactive atoms. He, he, he loved to make fun of theorists in a uh, hundred different ways. And for some reason, theorists love that. <laughs> and uh, because the atoms now is, uh, is uh, very well confined in space and also cooled, so it's also confined in momentum space, and you can polarize them uh, by uh, optical pumping, and there's no need for material walls around it to, uh, to stop the recoil ions or to scatter the beta particles. So, so it's really ideal for beta decay uh, correlation experiments. And the, the beta decay uh, rate uh, follows this expression right here. Okay? Uh, this uh, first term here describes the beta decay rate, so the lifetime of the beta decay. But there are all, also all kinds of correlations. Let me mention a few. There's a correlation between the momentum of the uh, beta and the momentum of the neutrinos. There's a beta neutrino correlation, and the coefficient is the little a. Okay? And if you have the parent nucleus polarized with a spin direction, then and there's a correlation between the uh, spin of the parent nucleus and momentum of the beta. This is the famous beta asymmetry correlation that was used first to discover uh, parity violation in the weak interaction. And the coefficient is, is a big A. And there's a similar uh, neutrino asymmetry correlation with a, a big B. And finally, there is a triple correlation between the spin of parent nucleus and the two momentum, the, the big D. Okay, So these alphabets have been used to search for physics beyond the standard model. And Stuart, throughout his career, studied these alphabets. And in his view, by, provide, by uh, performing precision measurements, they, he may find a clue to physics beyond the standard model. Interestingly, uh, these uh, different terms uh, have different fundamental symmetry properties. The beta neutrino correlations uh, respect both parity and time reversal symmetry. The triple correlation violates T, but preserves parity. And uh, Jerry has already covered Stuart's work on Neon 19. And using Neon 19, Stuart and Frank Calaprice has explored uh, many of these uh, parameters uh, on Neon 19. I should say that there will be a session tomorrow, uh, session H9 on neutron physics, where each of these alphabets will be discussed in more details. Uh, Stuart participated in several of these experiments. For example, he was part of the EMIT collaboration where they just published a, a new uh, upper limit 
on, on the D parameter. They found that D was uh, con consistent with zero with an upper limit uh, around few parts in 10 to the fourth. He also measured the, the, the big A parameter, the beta A symmetry parameter. Uh, this was part of the, the Perkeo collaboration uh, in Heidelberg in the late 1980s. So there they used uh, a, uh, polarized neutrons coming in into this uh, superconducting solenoid. Jerry has already explained the usefulness of the, this very strong magnetic field that can guide beta particles uh, onto the uh, detectors over here and here. Since neutrons are polarized longitudinally, you would get the beta particles emitted along the spin and against the spin. And taking this ratio, you would uh, extract the, the big A parameter. Okay? The big A parameter, uh, combined with the lifetime of the neutron, can be uh, used to der derive the VUD, the, the largest element in the CKM matrix, uh, and also test the unitarity of the CKM matrix, and hopefully uh, find clue for a fourth family of quarks. This was a picture taken uh, at, uh, uh, of the Perkeo team. Uh, the experiment happened at the Institute of Lao Langevin in Grenoble. And this gives Stuart an excuse to go to France often. He loved traveling. He would uh, travel to France. He would find experiments to do in Grand Sasso in Italy. And Karsten mentioned uh, his many trips to Japan and to China. He loved to observe different cultures. He, he had all kinds of interesting stories about how differently people of different cultures will approach things in experiments and in life. He loved work, working with young people, as Carson already mentioned. Uh, this young guy right here, Hartmut Abella, was a diploma student at the time. Today, he's a leader of the new Perkeo collaboration. Uh, so Hartmut right here, surrounded by a new generation of young people. Uh, they just uh, uh, finished measuring the, the big A parameter uh, with the increased precision. Instead of 2%, it's now half a percent. And the uh, in close collaboration and competition with them is the US, US UCNA uh, experiment. Okay, so here you see, I, I thank Albert Young for this slide. Here you see uh, uh, ultra cold neutrons being fed into this uh, detection zone. You have uh, uh, beta counters uh, against the spin and along the spin, and again, so superconducting solenoid to focus the beta particles. So instead of the cold neutrons in the Perkeo case, this is ultra cold neutrons. They are completely trapped inside this cell. And they use a, a basically a magnetic field, a barrier to polarize the UCN uh, neutrons. Both experiments, Perkeo and UCNA, are ongoing. And they're aiming for a higher precision, perhaps 0.2% or maybe even 0.1%. So going back to 19, late 1980s, I'm going to jump back and forth between present and the past quite a bit, because uh, uh, this is about scientific legacy of Stuart. So I want to tell you what Stuart did back then and how that's related to what's happening today. When I first met Stuart was in the 1988-89, a momentous event happened in physics. Cold fusion was, uh, was observed. So uh, as Jerry talked, that Stuart loved all these uh, controversy ideas, he would jump on it and start working and uh, trying either to verify or to debunk the idea. So, so there was, I was a theory student at the time, and I uh, was slowly finding out that I wasn't really cut out to be a theorist. Meanwhile, Professor Stuart Friedman and his group, uh, and his, uh, his heavy water vial, was about to change the world with this new energy source. So, so I decided to jump ship. I just joined his group. But it took me a while to complete uh, whatever the paperwork needed to, to join his group. And uh, during that several months, Stuart had already figured out that this cold fusion data was not uh, reproducible. And in fact, he found something interesting about the original data announcing cold fusion and uh, wrote a letter to, to Nature, the editors of Nature. This was uh, written by Stuart and uh, his uh, uh, postdoc at the time, Danny Krakauer. Let me read the first paragraph. It says, Sir, Jones et al. have claimed to have observed cold nuclear fusion. Their data, however, have a peculiar characteristic. 
which may indicate a systematic bias in the data collection procedure. What was that peculiar characteristic? So let's look at the Jones et al., the original data. This is uh, a vertical axis, is a foreground to background ratio. Foreground means neutron detecting the right energy of the fusion. Background means neutron, uh, the neutron background. So if the ratio is above one, that's a positive identification for fusion. Horizontal axis is the wrong number. Okay, so, so clearly, uh, there's a positive signal going on. What Stuart and Danny noticed was that there's a very large variation in error bars. Some of the error is very small, indicating a very long run, lots of statistics. Some error bars are large, indicating a short run. So they replotted the data uh, over here. Same data, but just rearranged. Instead of uh, the horizontal axis, instead of run number, it's now run length. And when they replot the data, a, a pattern emerged. Okay, the large error bars was, and, and then, and then short, small error bars, but closer to one. What could have caused this pattern? They did a bunch of different uh, analysis, and they showed that a simulation uh, of this data. They said, well, if we follow the following uh, procedure, uh, if an experimenter actively follows the data as the data comes in, okay, so the data will come in, and this ratio will jump up and down due to statistical fluctuation, okay? Now, the experimenter uh, is having, having his hand on the button, okay? If he sees the data goes uh, above one by, say, two sigma, you would terminate the, this run and call that, uh, record that as a data point, a good data point, okay? And if you see the data goes below one, you would wait, and then uh, sometimes it will come back up, then will terminate the, the run, okay, record that. And if you wait a long time and it never comes above one, say, so, well, something's wrong with the apparatus, right? Let's begin again. So if you follow that procedure, you would uh, have this simulation, have a pattern that looks very much like what Jones had published. So it's a very interesting detective work I enjoyed. Now, to be fair to Jones, they did reply to this letter and stated that that was not done during the experiment. But anyway, uh, by the time I joined, the, the code fusion was finished, so I was stuck in Stuart's group, and I needed a new project. And that's when he told me about his idea of laser trapping of radioactive atoms. So I jumped on that bandwagon instead. And by this time, uh, Stuart had moved to, to Berkeley, and uh, this is the, the Berkeley uh, laser trapping group. Uh, you see Brian Fujikawa right here. He was a postdoc back then, and uh, uh, he worked with Stuart for the longest time. He is now the group leader of the weak interaction group uh, at Berkeley that Stuart has left behind. Uh, we went to Berkeley for that there's an 88 inch cyclotron at Berkeley with a, that can provide a, a very intense beam of protons, and then we shine proton onto the magnesium target to produce sodium 21. It's a radioactive isotope of sodium with a half life of about 20 seconds. And with a few years of effort, we did trap sodium-21. Now, the fact that sodium-21 could be laser-trapped, that was not unexpected. The physics of trapping stable sodium isotope, radioactive sodium isotope, should be exactly the same, with a little bit of frequency difference. What was not clear at the time was what was the efficiency that could be achieved with these laser traps. Our atomic physics friends, they were using sodium by the grams. They would put a gram of sodium into the oven, right? Meanwhile, even with Berkeley's microamp proton beams, we could produce perhaps 10 picograms over a whole day of runtime. So, so there's a vast difference between the source strengths. So when we demonstrated trapping, and uh, uh, I should read this sentence that Stuart has written uh, in our conclusion section of this paper. He said, this experiment demonstrates that it is possible to load traps efficiently enough to study very short-lived atoms. That was the significance of this work. APS uh, loved this result and put out uh, the picture on the poster of the spring meeting of that year. Uh, it was taken in May, actually, uh, 1996. And you see that uh, the APS artists were impressed, not so much by the trapped atoms, but more by the light scatter off the edge of the windows. <laughs> 
So uh, with that, I declared victory and graduated, and a new team moved in. Uh, this was uh, uh, Nick Schelzo, a new graduate student in Stewart's group, and Paul Vetter, a postdoc at the time. Paul then be promoted to a staff position, and Paul really led this uh, effort to the first successful science result. So let me show you the science result. Here you have sodium atoms trapped in the middle with no material walls around it, and they could uh, detect both the beta particle and the recoil ion. And so this is a recoil ion detector, a multi-channel plate detector. Over here is another multi-channel plate detector for shake-off electrons. Now they tried this experiment with beta and ion detection, and this is a new way of doing things that Paul uh, started on. When the sodium decays to neon, the nucleus uh, receives such a violent kick that the atom shakes off one, sometimes two, or even three electrons. Those atomic electrons have very low energy, so they can be sweep, swept by electric field uh, or onto this detector with nearly 100% efficiency. So that way you get higher statistics. Certainly the direction of beta particle, uh, that information was lost. On the other hand, you have a more, more statistics and you can still detect the momentum, uh, measure the momentum of the recoil ion using the shake off electrons as a, as a trigger for the time of flight measurements. Okay? Uh, now, uh, how do you get beta neutrino correlation uh, information without detecting the beta? Well, you can look at these two extreme cases. If the beta and neutrino go uh, in opposite directions, the momentum of the ion would be small. Uh, if they go in the same direction, the momentum of the ion would be large. So if you measure the, the momentum spectrum more carefully and then fit this uh, with, with a good model, you can extract the beta neutrino correlation uh, coefficient, the, this little a coefficient. Okay? That's what they did. And they achieved the precision around 1 to 2 percent. So let's uh, put the data point and compare that with the standard model. This is a sodium 21 uh, on the V minus A line. So in the standard model, beta decay is governed by vector minus axial vector. So, so the, the little a uh, would uh, fall on, on these, this line. Okay? If new physics, for example, tensor uh, versus scalar would tilt this line. There are several other cases uh, where the little a was measured. There was this potassium-38 measurement done by John Baer and colleagues at the Triumph. They also used laser trapping technique on, on the laser trapping of potassium. And then recently, Guy Savard and his colleagues at Argonne has just published this result on lithium-8. Lithium-8 would be over here. And here they used not a laser trap, but an ion trap of lithium, uh, lithium atoms. <clears throat> the horizontal axis is the Fermi fraction. If the decay is purely Fermi type, such as uh, the potassium-38, uh, you would plot the data here. If it's a purely gamma optella type, such as helium-6, you would plot it over here. Neutron and sodium-21 were mixed type. They contain both Fermi type and gamma optella type uh, beta decays. This uh, helium-6 number was measured back in 1963 <coughs> by Johnson et al. at Oak Ridge uh, using not any traps but a diffuse gas and a magnetic spectrometer to detect the recoil ion momentum. And now today there is a new experiment pursued by my colleague at Argonne, Peter Mueller, and Alejandro Garcia at the University of Washington at Semper, trying to use the laser trapped helium-6 uh, atoms for a better improved measurement. Helium-6 is a good case <coughs> because it's a very simple atom, simple nucleus. Both the structure of the atom and nucleus are calculable. And the decay is 100% uh, uh, branching ratio. So it's a very, uh, very simple case, very clean. And so they hope to measure the little a to 0.1% using this uh, the new technique. So they are building this apparatus, a beta detector and recoil ion uh, detector over here. So that concludes my quick review of the laser trapping for beta decay uh, studies. 
Now let me move into a new area, a laser trapping of radioactive atoms for uh, fundamental symmetry tests uh, by measuring the atomic properties. So there we don't really need the atom to be radioactive. The radioactivity is not what we want. But uh, on the other hand, uh, theorists have told us that in this mass 200 region, uh, the, the symmetry violating effects uh, tend to be enhanced by a one, two, or even three orders magnitude. So uh, on the other hand, it just so happens that in this region, there are no stable isotopes. So we have to live with radioactive isotopes. Let me give you two examples. First example is uh, francium atoms for parity violation experiments. This effort started quite early by Jean Sprouse and Luis Orozco at the uh, St Stony Brook, actually about the same time when we were doing the sodium work at Berkeley. So there were really two parallel efforts going on uh, in, these, in those early days. And today, the experiment is being joined by John Baer and Gerald Grinner, and is taking place at Triumph. The, the plan is to trap francium atoms and place the francium atoms at the antinode of this uh, RF standing wave. Okay? And then by measuring the parity violating effects in the atoms, uh, they, they hope to extract the anapole moment of the francium nucleus. This moment violates parity, but respects time reversal symmetry. And it has been observed only once in cesium-133 nucleus in Carl, by Carl Wyman's uh, parity violation experiments, actually not far from here. And so, but in francium, this moment is supposed to be larger by one order of magnitude. So they set out to do this measurement. Now, the second example I want to tell you is, to, is a search for electric dipole moment in radium-225. This moment violates both parity and time reversal symmetry. Uh, theorists have pointed out that radium-225, because of the octopole deformation, enhances the, uh, the EDM uh, by quite a bit, comparing with mercury-199, where the, the, the standard uh, EDM experiment has been, has been going on and has sent the benchmark for all other EDM experiments. The radium EDM is supposed to be larger by two to three orders magnitude. So it's a huge gain. So we are trying to take advantage of this enhancement factor. But there's a catch. So, uh, radium-225 is radioactive with only 15-day half-life. So again, we're dealing with very small amount of atom to start with. We need the laser trap to concentrate these, uh, these uh, precious atoms for us to do the, the measurement. So uh, cur uh, currently, there are two groups pursuing uh, this approach. Well, our group at Argonne, and there's another group at KVI in Netherlands uh, doing these experiments. So over the years, we have developed a bunch of techniques towards the EDM measurement. Uh, in 07, we realized the first magneto-optical trap of radium atoms, radium-2 to 5 atoms. And then in order to move the atoms into a region where we can do EDM measurement, we need to first uh, trap the atoms into an optical dipole trap without the need for magnetic field. And that we also uh, realized in 2010. Uh, over here, you see an image of the magneto-optical trap. That's a round sphere. And then a sharp line. That's the optical dipole trap. Basically, a focused, single focus laser beam where the atoms are attracted to the focal point. Then we move the focal point of the laser beam. Atoms will follow from here to a neighboring chamber on the side. And very recently, we observed the spin precession of radium-225 inside the optical dipole trap. So that's a significant step forward. And we're looking forward to the next step, where we want to place this optical dipole trap uh, in between a pair of electrodes, about two millimeters apart. Okay? And then we would turn on the electric field and see if the precession frequency of the spin change or not. And EDM will cause a tiny little bit of change uh, when we switch the E field back and forth. So that's what's going on. Finally, let me show you yet another direction the laser trapping of radioactive atoms have taken us. It was totally unexpected uh, by us when we started working on this. We were all thinking about radioactive atoms produced in accelerators. But of course, radioactive atoms exist in nature, in the environment as well, produced by cosmic rays 
or by other human uh, activities. Um, a very famous example that you're all familiar with is uh, carbon-14. Uh, in nature, by analyzing carbon-14, we learn a lot in archaeology and many other disciplines. Uh, there are other radioactive isotopes, so, uh, krypton-81, argon-39, krypton-85, that have many uses in geoscience. And they were very difficult to detect because the isotopic abundance was really low at 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 16. People tried several different ways, including accelerated mass spectrometry, but it didn't work out very well. We solved the problem using this laser trapping technique. We found that laser trap, of course, we can see a single atom in the trap. And another remarkable thing about this trap is that the trap never makes a mistake. When it sees a trap, uh, 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 when this sees a signal of uh, indicating at Krypton 81, uh, it's never wrong, even at 10 to the minus 16th level. So with this new technique, we are opening up new applications in Earth science. Uh, we we want to date groundwater and map the flow of groundwater all over the world. In the past year, we have done nine projects with samples sent to us from five different continents. So geoscientists are, are finding this technique. They're organizing workshops and sessions in geoscience conferences to talk about what scientific opportunities, opportunities uh, can be realized with this new technique. We have also done a, 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 a test project on Antarctica ice. Our goal is to map Antarctica ice uh, uh, over the, the continent. And we want to map the ocean currents as well. This we have not started yet, because the counting rate for argon-39 is currently too low uh, for, for this task. All right, uh, let me just uh, wrap up. Uh, all these different activities started with a simple idea that Stuart had uh, back in 1989. And he, I knew that he was very happy to see all these things happening. He was very proud to see the achievements of his associates. And he, he loved visiting laser labs and playing with the atom traps, most of the time making it disappear, so then we have to fix it. Uh, so here he was, having a great time in the laser lab. I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Ah, yes, so the memory effect. So, you know, you, you putting one sample, the question is uh, about the memory effect in our trace analysis uh, uh, instruments. So you're putting one sample, say, from Australia, and you do the analysis, right? And tomorrow, somebody from uh, uh, Africa wants to uh, analyze a different sample. But in between, some of the atoms get stuck. Australian uh, Krypton-81 got stuck in the, in, the, in the instrument, and we have to wash it out. And that today is, is, a, is a limitation in how fast we can analyze samples, how many samples we can handle in a year, because it takes a day and a half to wash the instruments. And we hope to find a better solution so we can analyze five, 500 different samples in a year. Geologists want wants us to analyze thousands of samples in a year. Okay, so the measurement takes two to three hours, but the wash takes uh, 20, 30 hours, okay? So one, two of the fourth solution is to build five different apparatuses and run them in parallel. It's not unthinkable, given the cost and compared with AMS and what's already happening, it's actually practical. So that's actually being discussed. But of course, uh, being an instrument maker, I want to find a better solution. There's a question over there. Yeah. Yeah, there you go.
Yeah, I would love to be able to, to date the core, but so f at this point, we still need about 20 kilograms of sample to do one analysis. So we're not efficient enough to deal with a small, small core sample. Okay, what I'm talking about, what geologists are talking about nowadays, is to go to the edge of the glacier and get the near surface ice. Now, ice build up in the dome and they flow. Old ice actually at the bottom slowly flow out and come back near the surface. Those ice today are not being used because there are no other ways to determine the age of, of these samples. With Krypton 81, they can actually go dig up the near surface ice and then and be brought to our lab for dating. And then they have a ton of uh, these old eyes to study. So that's what we're doing today. Okay. 